Realism is the idea that the things that we perceive exist externally of our minds. Externally of our minds? But what does that mean? When philosophers talk about perception and reality, they refer to the physical world and the mental world. Objects in the physical world actually exist, whilst objects and sensations in the mental world have been created by the mind. Direct realists believe that the physical world is exactly as it appears to us, that is, the physical world equals the mental world, and everything that we see, hear, touch, smell and taste actually looks, sounds, feels, smells and tastes the way that we perceive it. Hmm. However, there is a problem. If the pictures that our minds create are exactly the same as the pictures in the physical world, why are we fooled by optical illusions? For example, if I actually perceive the picture below as it physically exists, the wheels would appear still. The fact that they're not proves that there's some difference between what I perceive and what actually exists. There's also the issue of hallucinations. Surely it isn't true that people who are on drugs and think that they're flying really are? Finally, saying that something is the way that it appears indicates that there is a correct way to view an object. Whilst this may be true for something like a photo, is it true in real life? If I stand over one side of the room and you stand over the other, we are both going to see the toast standing in the middle. However, because we're both viewing it from different sides, we're going to see it slightly differently. Perspective is therefore objective, and things will appear differently depending on how you look at them. So what now? At this point, you could become an anti-realist, a position where you reject the existence of a physical world entirely and conclude that everything you experience is created by your mind. Happy? Didn't think so. That's why 2,000 years ago, a clever chap named Aristotle came up with an idea called representative realism. This stated that instead of perceiving an object in the physical world directly, the brain perceives signals from the object, which allows it to build up a representation of it. We call these signals sense data, and it can include vibrations in the air, photons of light, or odor particles. Representative realists justify this theory through three main arguments. The time lag argument, the argument from causal dependency, and the argument from physics. We could tell you about all three, but Lauren told us to pick one. The time lag argument dictates that because of the vast distances between the Earth and other objects in space, light from the stars can take thousands of years to reach us. Therefore, when we look up at the night sky, and the light from these stars finally reaches our eyes, we don't see them as they are, but we view a representation of how they were thousands of years ago. This view brings together features of both anti-realism and direct realism. Although we don't perceive the world exactly as it is, we're perceiving it as it actually was in the past. Fair enough. But wait, there's a problem. If we don't perceive the physical world directly, how can we know for sure what it's actually like? For example, if we only see the stars thousands of years after they've shined, we have no real way of knowing if they look the way they do now thousands of years ago. This barrier between what we perceive and what actually exists has been called the veil of perception. You could argue that this doesn't particularly matter. After all, if the world in our heads didn't look at least something like the real thing, our species would have died out years ago. However, it's entirely possible that our senses could have evolved to distort the world in such a way that could help us survive. For example, bats are almost blind, and as a result don't see the world the way we do. However, their power of echolocation allows them to get a pretty good idea of their surroundings, even though this isn't how the real world looks. Going back to hallucination, we can even experience sensations with no external stimuli present, and as a result, we're forced to conclude that the external world may not exist. The second criticism came about in 1690, when English philosopher John Locke stated that we define objects by primary and secondary properties, primary qualities being undeniable objective features of an object, such as size and shape, and secondary qualities being subjective, such as colour and taste. Locke demonstrated this by putting one hand in hot water and the other hand in cold water, then placing them both in lukewarm water. Although the lukewarm was at a set temperature, each hand felt that it was hotter or colder than the other, proving that heat isn't a rigid, fixed feature of an object. However, as time went on, people began applying this to both primary and secondary qualities. George Berkeley, for example, said that because everything we know about an object has been perceived by the senses, there's no way of telling a primary quality from a secondary one. For example, the apparent size of an object varies depending on how you look at it, meaning that size can't be a primary quality. Another philosopher, J. L. Austin, questioned the argument from illusion. The argument assumes that because something is perceived to have a property, there must be something with that property that exists. 
Austin didn't like this, and said that there was no need for sense data to explain why objects look different to how they are. They simply look different. To demonstrate this, he described a church painted and decorated to look like a barn. You wouldn't see a barn, or an illusion of a barn, you'd just see a church, decorated so that it looked like a barn. In the case of the wheels mentioned earlier, Austin would say that you are seeing stationary wheels that appear to be moving, nothing more and nothing less. Finally, you could argue that sense data doesn't make a lot of sense. Sense data is non-physical, it's created by the mind. But at the same time, it has the properties of everything we perceive, including size and shape. This makes it both physical and non-physical at the same time. Even if we change the definition of sense data to a physical thing inside our heads, it doesn't solve the problem. After all, the thought of an apple isn't apple shaped, so sense data is not actually in the brain because it can possess an actual shape. But this again fails to explain how we experience hallucinations, experiences that happen exclusively inside the mind. You could argue that sense data is what it appears to be, but that's basically direct realism all over again, and it still doesn't take into account hallucinations, which aren't anywhere at all. The argument goes on, but as far as we're concerned, it's goodbye sense data. In conclusion, what you see isn't necessarily what you get. Perhaps, as Voltaire said, we should stop forming theories and go cultivate our gardens. You might even get a hallucination or two.